So there's my CV, very boring, the usual academic stuff. Uh, but I've done relevant stuff most of my life. But I do have a link, a very close link, and I'm, I was very upset when I heard about the drilling at Leith Hill a few years ago. Um, because um, I was there camping on Leith Hill <laughs> almost 60 years ago. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't protesting, other than possibly about the burnt sausages on the scout campfire. But I know and love this area. I've hiked and camped all over it when I was a teenager. So I do have a soft spot for Leith Hill. I'm going to start by comparing the Greater Weald and Wessex Basin, shown here in purple, so I'll try and just use the pointer, to the Bakken shale play of North America, which is inside this dotted line here. And that only, it does go up into Canada, north of the 49th parallel. And there's a close similarity between the Bakken unconventional oil play and the Weald, because it's basically a shale within which, in the middle of it, there's the Bakken limestone in North Dakota. And they use the Bakken limestone to drill horizontally and frack uh, to get at the shale above and below it. And it so happens that a thin limestone is a very nice place to do your fracking. And I'm sure you're all aware now there are a couple of limestones in the Kimmeridge clay, which is a shale, in the Weald. The structure of the Kimmeridge clay is indicated by this purple line, which is the Weald Basin extending west into the Wessex Basin. It's about one-tenth the size of, as you can see, the Bakken Basin of North Dakota. Now, in the whole of the Bakken Basin, there's only one geological fault, and it's up here on the border of where they're drilling. There are no other faults doing anything significant. They're just trivial little faults at depth. Uh, over the whole of the Bakken. Yeah. In comparison, in this comparatively tiny area of the wheel, I showed some of you this slide several years ago, which is why it's got uh, Celtic Energy mentioned. They're now, in effect, defunct. But look how it's covered <coughs> with faults. It's geologically a far more complex area than the Bakken. And the Bakken area as a shale play was the quite hot hope for indigenous unconventional oil in North America only started in 2011 but it's already dead, no one is drilling there anymore. It had this short lifestyle, life span uh, and as a shale play it's now dead. Now if I superimpose the drilling that has happened in that brief period of time at the same scale, superimpose it on the wheeled basin, if you can remember that purple elongate structure map of the Kimmeridge clay, it's the, all the horizontal drilling and fracking, frac, fracking in the Bakken of North Dakota superimposed on Surrey and Sussex. So up in, up in the north, thanks James, uh, London is marked up here, Guildford somewhere on the west, yeah there, and the south coast is somewhere down here, there's the Thames estuary. So here is the density of wells if the Weald were to turn into the Bakken oil shale play, wells every mile or so and fracked the horizontal sections of the wells running uh, north or generally north-south off of that. So this is what would happen in the Weald if we were allowed, uh, if we were to allow it to become a fully industrialised, uh, unconventional oil province. <coughs> So in contrast to the extreme simplicity of the Bakken, flat layers for hundreds of miles, nothing is happening, no one lives there apart from a few farmers. There are, you know, um, it's a very simple geology, very boring in fact. Um, faulting is critical in the UK. A typical fracking diagram, which uh, there are many versions of these, and I came across these about eight or nine years ago, I thought, why do they always show such simple geology? Just flat layers, we call it layer cake geology, and then here's the well that was down vertically, turns horizontally in the shale layer, and then the fracking happens down here. This actually is an accurate diagram for the shale basins of North America. There's no problem with that. It's not misleading in that sense. 
But in the UK, the basins are cut by faults which can act as conduits for flow of pollutant material from the fracking zone down here right up to the surface. Faults generally act as conduits. They're not barriers to flow. More often they're the opposite. They're an easy path up to the surface. There have now been six separate computer modelling studies modelling the flow of pollutant material from a frack shale up to the groundwater zone. And they all agree, yes, it goes up the faults. The only argument is the time scale, varying from a couple of years. Uh, in the case of gas, it's only a few days for the gas to go from there up to the top. Um, but for the fluids with contaminants, uh, it can vary depending on which model study you want to believe from a few years up to a maximum of a thousand years. So I like to take a kind of logarithmic average of this and say, well, in a generation, we would have a problem, say 30 years. So let's now look at the weald in a bit more detail, the, obviously the area you're interested in. And homing straight in on the so-called Holmwood Prospect, uh, which is actually under Cold Harbour. But it was called Holmwood by BP, who first discovered it in the early 80s. They hung on to this prospect when they relinquished some of their license in 1987, so they liked it, but they never did anything with it. So obviously BP thought there was something dodgy about it, which I think is maybe trying to tell us a lesson. So BP eventually gave it up, and it has eventually passed into this little uh, fly-by-night company called Europa. Now, the crucial thing here is the faults. So the interpretation of the subsurface geology depends on seismic lines. These green lines numbered off, which generally run north-south. There's only one line time from east to west, just through the Cold Harbour area here. Uh, no, I'm sorry, just through the drill site area. And Europa have mapped two faults at depth, which I've labelled their fault P up here, and another east-west running fault, more or less bounding the target zone of the deep geology, roughly circular area that they want to target down here, just south of uh, Leith Hill. Now the basic problem with this is, for such a small target, you don't really have enough seismic data to make a sensible interpretation. There are not enough data in the area. So this is a fundamental inadequacy of their interpretation. I've looked again at the geology and the seismic data just very quickly. And the Europa Fault P, to my mind, seems probably okay. And my version of it, at a shallower depth, it comes through here. And these two are, in effect, the same vault, fault as seen at different depths, shallower and deeper. That's okay. But their east-west bounding, target bounding fault, as I call it, is, I think, all wrong. It runs across the, pros across the target to the southeast here. And further south, the geology is more complex because I've got north-south running faults here, as seen on the seismic data, which happen to match the faults mapped at the surface of the Earth by the British Geological Survey, shown in red. And none of these are shown in the Europa interpretation. So I don't have a finished story here, and you can't have a finished story because you don't have enough data. So we have to bear that in mind. Their interpretation uh, is too simplistic. So they are depending on essentially one piece of seismic data, which is 37 years old. They have interpreted it uh, to show the geology marked uh, by the coloured uh, layers here. And then more recently, only in the last few months, they've reinterpreted it to try and satisfy the Environment Agency with new layering, which roughly matches in some places their older layering going back 10 or 12 years. So my first question is, how come they've been sitting on this licence uh, for more than 10 years and they've decided what the geology is, not that I necessarily believe it, but then all of a sudden they've updated it only in the last few months to try and satisfy some environment agency questions and they've got a new fault coming up here. They've thrown away these old three faults here which were their story up till uh, um, 
two or three years ago. They've now got a new fault coming in up here, stopping just below where they're putting a new drill trajectory shown in black to replace the older one shown in white. Now, funnily enough, I like this vertical fault here. That corresponds more or less to my fault Q. But the difference is I interpret that fault as going right through the drill zone across this little offset here, which is a fault, and right up to the surface. So there's a fault cutting right through here. And I'm going to put it to the Environment Agency that this is a more sound interpretation than the Europas, who, which have, who have just changed their mind recently, um, and that the Environment Agency will have to take this into account. And the woman I spoke to at the EA just an hour ago seems to be listening. She says she will bear this in mind. What I've also done is tie in, as we call it, the seismic data from uh, a known existing well, Collendine Farm number one up here, very near Horse Hill. This was drilled in 1964 uh, by Shell. And you can trace the seismic all the way along. It looks like a long way. It is about 19 kilometres <coughs> along the seismic line here. And then do a kind of semi three-point turn, back up to Holmwood number one, up the crucial seismic line labelled V8153. The 81 means it was vintage 1981. It's ancient data. So you can tie in from the known results from Collendine Farm number one, which are in a table here. And I've squashed up all the seismic, the whole 19 kilometres of it, to make one picture. So without any interpretation, I think you will agree just by looking from the Collendine Farm number one well here, I've put in, in brackets, the Hastings beds, which they did not interpret, but they come along, they drop down a fault zone here, then along here, change of seismic vintage, which is why it looks a bit different, and up here, just to near the Holmwood proposed well. And similarly, let's just look at the Kimmeridge limestone, the very strong reflector here, comes along and then up through the well here. So you can make these ties and uh, then you get this result, which is the Hastings beds, which are the top of an important aquifer, are bounded by my fault zone Q, which in squashed up form <coughs> comes up to be very nearly looking vertical. It's got a bit of a slope to the north on it, to your right. And similarly, uh, the, the, the fault, the, um, the, the well path is projected to go down through all these various layers here. So these labels here are all tied in from Collendine Farm well nearly 20 kilometres away. So my worry with uh, the Holmwood one well is they're going to be going through at a very shallow angle. This is highly squashed. They'll be going through at a very shallow angle for drilling at the limit of modern technology through a fault zone and through this um, Hastings bed aquifer. And they've tried to disguise that by accident or by design, but they've limited the fault coming up here, stopping just here. And I think this is not the case. So, my view on this is that they have to go back and do their homework, look at everything again. Ideally, they should be out there collecting modern seismic, not using old stuff from 1981. And really, even more ideally, because of the structure is complex and very three-dimensional, they really need to shoot a three-dimensional seismic survey. Now, I don't know how much this will impede them, but it will cost them a good million. And... Uh, will take another year to uh, purchase, you know, to have it commissioned and then to interpret. So the best I can say about this is they need to collect a lot more data. They haven't done their homework. It's all very dodgy. Now back to um, the comparison between the Bakken in North Dakota with the Weald analogy. How we 
interpret limestones and sandstones and all that sort of thing is not from taking cores from a well, because the well just drills and grinds everything up. What you do is a thing called logging, where you drop instruments down the hole after you've drilled it, and the wiggles on the, what we call these logs, these readings, give you a very good indication of the rock lithology, and even if there's water or gas or oil present. A skilled interpreter can read all this kind of stuff. So here's the Balcom number one well, uh, drilled in 1986 by Conoco, and I've got the proper well log for it. I was able to make up this diagram. The two crucial things are two logs called the gamma ray and the sonic. And basically, to recognize a proper limestone, you'll have low gamma ray, the readings go to the left, at the same time as the sonic velocity goes very high, readings going to the right. So you make a nice little graph like this, where it's all nicely colored up, and shale is sort of in the middle. That's the red line running down the middle. That would be shale, where the two logs meet in the middle, like here. And then the white zones, kicking out to the left or the right, for gamma ray or sonic, respectively, they tell you if there's sandstone or limestone present. A true limestone is like the grey oolite and inferior oolite, where there's a complete kick to the left of the gamma and a complete kick to the right of the sonic. So there's proper limestone. And then the Corallian is quite a good limestone and the sandstone's there as well. Same with the Portland Purbeck. But the crucial thing of interest, of course, in the Kimmeridge clay, these so-called micrites, which is an industry term for a muddy limestone, you could call it, but you could equally call it a carbonaceous mudstone. You know, it's only, as you can see from the graph, you can see it yourself, it's only halfway to being a proper limestone. The kicks aren't properly to the left or right. But the industry has honed in on this word micrite. In fact, they now call it limestone to try and avoid using the dirty word shale. And not only that, they're finding, especially UCOG, are finding more and more micrites all the time. Uh, the BGS recognises two micrites throughout the wheel basin, and I believe the BGS. And locally, there's a third micrite here uh, present towards the east. But these cowboy companies are recognising more micrites, or what they call limestones, down here, and it's really just not, not true at all. Now back over to uh, east of here, to Collendine Farm number one, a very old well, and then the Horse Hill well drilled about three years ago. Once UCOG had drilled this well, they realised that their version of the faults was all a bit of a mess. And they tried to sort it by keeping the faults, but they swapped over the sense of throw. That means whether it goes down to your right or down to your left. They swapped that over. You can see the tooth marks on, the, on this fault. They swap over here to down throwing to the north, and then the tick marks swap over back again to the south over here. Now this is geologically nonsense, except in special regimes which do not apply in the geology of the wheel. And my version of reinterpreting this, which is a bit of a mess, it doesn't make sense geologically, but to reconcile the Collendine Farm and the Horse Hill number one wells, is this slide. where I have a fault running close to Collendine Farm number one, and then a fault running very close to Horse Hill and dying out just to the west. So it so happens that UCOG drilled very close to a fault zone. And that explains why they got the, you know, the famous Gatwick gusher, the huge uh, oil flows temporarily at Horse Hill number one, from one of these limestones. So here's a picture of the limestone, typically 30 metres thick, but near a fault zone, which I've just put in here arbitrarily as vertical, there's a so-called damage zone which runs for 100 metres either side of the fault itself. This is where the rock has been fractured by the movements, and of course which produced earthquakes maybe millions of years ago, of this fault line. So what, the, what you get is limestone which is tight here, 
very low permeability, requires stimulation, which means acidizing or fracking, to get any oil out of it. But if you drill here, you're in the limestone that has been fractured by being so close to the fault. And that's why at Horse Hill Number 1, drilled 60 metres north of the fault, they got this high oil flow. But it's a bit of a fiddle because it's temporary, it won't last, and it's in a, it's a, in a very geologically unusual area. But of course, UCOG are talking, talking it up, they're bigging it up, and they're, say, they're trying to claim that the high oil flow they got here temporarily, three years ago, <coughs> is going to apply all over the wheel. And we have this so-called continuous oil deposit all over the wheel. But it's just literally not believable. Turning now to a similar fiasco at Broadford Bridge <coughs> by Kimmeridge Oil and Gas, which is a subsidiary of UCOG. It was Celtic. It was, yeah. yes, it was Celtic Energy at one time. Celtic Energy had applied to drill a conventional prospect down at the Sherwood Sandstone. And that was what the licence, the permit, from West Sussex County Council specified. It was a permit to drill from the existing well pad down to the Sherwood, the Triassic Sherwood Sandstone. But uh, UCOG went and drilled in a different direction at 45 degrees to the northeast, not the northwest. And they didn't bother going down to the Sherwood, which was the specified target a conventional oil target. They went down at a steep angle and drilled Broadford Bridge number one, which is the upper blue and black line here. And they then claimed they had four micrites, one above the other, which they number from the bottom up. So it all gets a bit confusing. Now, I've, I don't have the results of exactly where these four limestones, so-called, are at Broadford Bridge number one. But this is an accurately scale diagram with the only extra thing I've added in as a proxy log for, uh, from a nearby well at Wynham here are the three micrites recognised by the BGS shown in green and for good measure I've allowed them a fourth one where there's a bit of a kick to the left on the gamma and a kick to right on the sonic you know how to read these logs now so you could say if you were pushing it there's another micrite or dirty limestone. So this could be their four dirty limestones, their micrites. But they had great trouble because basically they're incompetent. <laughs> they were drilling through uh, another limestone higher up here and the well bore got clogged. It washed out as they call it. They tried to clean it up. It didn't work. So they then had to redrill by doing a side track coming off from up here down to there, and then parallel to the existing wellbore. And that's called 1Z. And they're now claiming they found a fifth <laughs> micrite, which, you know, it's getting uh, sillier and sillier. And my explanation for that is I tried a model where you had dipping layers, doing something funny, to explain how you could get a fifth micrite in place by drilling at an angle, but that doesn't work. The only way to make it work is to have a fault zone cutting through, which I've just put arbitrarily vertically like that. And what they've done is they've encountered the upthrown side of the number four micrite. They've drilled it here, and then they've gone through it again here, <coughs> on the other side of a fault zone. So there are five micrites, and not that at all. It's just number four repeated by where they went through the fault zone. But they don't know any of that, because they don't have, basically they don't have good enough geologists to study this sort of problem. So they still think there are five micrites, which of course is what they're telling their investors. But the flows were so poor, as you probably know, from uh, the testing of these micrites, uh, that thank goodness their share price has uh, fallen because the investors finally are not believing in them. Now, I don't want to talk just about the wheel because there's a lot of activity going on in the north of England. <laughs> what uh, your local XMP, I think he was, David Howell, um, called the desolate northeast. He said, oh, it's okay to frack up there. It's a desolate area, you know, no one lives there. So tell that to the people of Lincolnshire, Yorkshire, and of course Lancashire. The, 
There's one example here which I call the failure of regulation by the Environment Agency. This is, uh, concerns drilling at a place called Misson Springs in Nottinghamshire, where I was asked to do a detailed study two years ago. And the basic point to note is that geology is all fairly simple, but it's aquifers all the way, from the principal aquifer of the East Midlands, our old friend the Sherwood Sandstone Group in Orange, another aquifer here, more aquifer here, more aquifer here, above the Boland Shale, which is what they want to target. So their well plan, I guess is well plan, was to drill vertically down and you do a kind of dog leg and then you go along the Boland Shale. And in analysing <coughs> their plans and the detailed geology, what I discovered is there's a previously unknown fault, which I've named the Misson Fault, cutting down through here, just next to the well bore. So here's another pathway from the frack shale, if and when they do this and frack it, up to the surface here. And the fault bounds where there's a very thin and inadequate cover of thin Mercia mudstone. So that's supposed to be a, an impermeable cover above the very valuable and important aquifer. But the clue is all in the name. Um, it's where the clays, just like uh, up on Leith Hill, where below the hive beds, which is the porous stuff, permeable, there's the atheville clay, and then that's the spring lines coming out either side. It's the same story here at Misson Springs, where the you have the end of the mudstones, and then over here sandstone. So this is where you're going to get springs. And furthermore, because I've now identified a fault crossing at right angles to that boundary, that's why there's a locality called Misson Springs. So it all sort of makes sense historically. The sad thing is the EA ignored all this detailed evidence I had submitted. They'd obviously, in effect, prejudged the issue. But what the EA concentrated on, and this is hard to believe, up here at the well site, they said we're very concerned that there's a, a port toilet which might get blown over in the wind <laughs> and will then leak into the springs, you know, just at Misson Springs. So we want that fixed, you know, it's got to be bolted down properly. They didn't, they didn't discuss at all the real problem which is faulting in this locality. So I consider that a failure by the EA in, uh, in Lincolnshire. And it's even worse uh, in the file in northwest Lancashire, where as we speak, and in fact Paddy is just off there, as he just said, off, off to Preston New Road now, where they have drilled uh, a well to be fracked down vertically at Preston New Road, and then they go horizontally, and then they will frack in here in a zone of coloured arbitrarily in blue. And then later on they want to go to Rosica Wood and go down and do the same job there. Now you see the complexity of the geology, all these faults cutting the different layers of geology, because over here we have the major principal aquifer feeding the whole of the Liverpool-Manchester conurbation. And the EA accepts, and I agree, that this is fed by rainwater falling in the Boland Fells over in the east, and the water flow is through shales and across fault zones into this layer here, which is drilled up with about 50 boreholes to feed Liverpool and Manchester. But the EA then says, down here, the water is saline, it's under a cover of 300 metres of the Mercia mudstone, so it's not important, we don't care about that. And they say it's saline and you know, it's not of interest, that will it never be of interest as drinking water. But I found two old wells here and here, west of the Woodsfold Fault, which I don't believe to be a barrier, unlike what the EA assumes. The groundwater flow will go through here and across the fault here and carry on to the west towards the IUC. That's the logical way for the groundwater to flow, from the mountains to the sea. Now I found two old wells here, going back 50 or 100 years. One is for a cotton spinning mill at Kirkham, where there's one of these huge steam engines, you know, thousands of horsepower. And they had a deep well feeding and supplying that huge steam engine. 
Now you can't, I asked an expert at this, you can't feed highly saline water into that steam engine because it would seize up and rust up in a matter of days or weeks. So it must have been fresh water they were using back in the 19th century. And just north of there, uh, there's a, a deep well, again, into this orange sandstone layer, <coughs> where there used to be uh, a dairy and cheese factory. And again, you would use highly saline water to make your cheese, or even to wash the utensils. So there must have been, the wells are both now, they've disappeared, but there must have been fresh water in this area. And last but not least, over in the west here, I've re-identified an old fault which was known 20 or 30 years ago, and I've remapped it, and surprise, surprise, it comes up to the surface, very near a little artificial lake used as a boating pond by a holiday camp, which is apparently fed by four springs with very clear, fresh drinking water. So where's this water coming from? So it may be that there's fresh water below the file the, and above the area it's going to be extensively fracked and the water here could be coming up this fault zone to feed that little Wake Park Lake, as it's called. So again, that's a, I think it's a failure of EA legislation, or sorry, of regulation, that they allow Quadrilla to frack in such a complex area. And just recently published a paper from some people at Durham They've said that you should really keep around 900 metres or more away from any fault zone. Now, the UK government has avoided any mention of a so-called respect distance or safety distance keeping away from faults. They do that in America, by the way, but no, in Britain they don't. They allow you to frack right next to faults because they know, in fact, that if you had to keep 900 metres away, then all this area, in effect, the whole file would be out of bounds because there are too many faults around. Uh, you know, so <clears throat> keeping away from all the faults means no fracking in that area. Uh, can I ask who, who that report was by you mentioned on, on the faults? Um, it's by guys at the Refine Group, funded by Durham and Newcastle, who are funded by industry, so I'm generally very suspicious of them. But there is a Professor Richard Davis who I think is actually a, basically a good guy, um, and he is prepared to publish stuff which, even though they're funded by industry, uh, the industry will not like. So it only came out a few weeks ago. Now back to government regulation and government definitions. I've got uh, a recent picture of Theresa May's cabinet. <coughs> I think that's her on the ground being dragged away by <laughs> Boris. And that's probably Philip Hammond there. Uh, escaping from uh, Westminster. <coughs> this is my image of the cowboy culture that's going on uh, in, the, in the current government and the industry. And the regulations are all about loosening it up to make it easy for these cowboy companies like UCOG and Europa and so on to operate. The first thing is how do, how do we define and differentiate between conventional resources, ordinary oil and gas exploration, in other words, and unconventional. And the UK government definition, which has legal force, by the way, is if it's sandstone or limestone, or for that matter, uh, coal, but we're not talking about coal tonight, then it's conventional. So it's enclosed in the red line here. That's the UK government's definition of conventional. And only if it's shale is it unconventional. But the, un but the universally agreed definition of the difference between the two is this semi-quantitative diagram, where the scale, by the way, is logarithmic. So it goes in factors of 10, increasing to the right side. <coughs> and everyone agrees that the figure of 0.1 for the units of permeability, which are millidarcies, 0.1 millidarcies is the boundary between conventional to the right and unconventional to the left. And as you can see, limestone straddles the boundary. It could be conventional or unconventional. And you can have something called tight sandstone, which is a sandstone, but it needs stimulation, i.e. fracking, 
and acidization to release the contents of it. Now the Kimmeridge clay so-called limestones, these micrites, we now have several measurements of them published, and they lie in this range from here to here. So there's no question they are unconventional limestones or micrites or whatever you want to call them. Along with the permeability definition, we have to consider in the definition the geological setting. If it's ill-defined and spread out, it's not a nice little lump underground like a conventional oil deposit. If it's spread out like the Kimmeridge limestones in the Weald, then that means it's more likely to be considered unconventional. And, of course, last but not least, if it requires stimulation to make the oil or gas flow, that means it's unconventional. So here's the scientific definition of unconventional versus conventional. And there's no question in my mind that any attempt to exploit these Kimmeridge clay so-called limestones, whether by acidization or by fracking, is unconventional prospecting. <clears throat> the next definition is how do you define uh, what is meant by high volume hydraulic <coughs> fracking or HVHF. And the US Geological Survey did a very thorough study of 264,000 fracked wells over the whole of the US. These are not shale basins, by the way, they're water catchment areas. <coughs> So it's a hydrologist's view of most of eastern half of North America here. And the wells come in three flavours. It can be vertical, deviated or horizontal. <coughs> and what they have shown is that the water volumes used in the horizontal wells, which by and large almost entirely mean the fracked oil and gas wells, are um, high volume and they're clearly separated from the vertical or deviated wells, oil in green, gas in red, by a threshold for, of about 2,000 cubic metres of water use per well, or in, for the gas wells, 2,500 cubic metres. So these are the kind of thresholds above which you can say it's high volume hydraulic fracking. So why has the UK government defined it as a criterion way up here at 10,000 cubic metres per well, it's because they're trying to make it easy for the oil and gas industry in the UK. So they could frack a well at using 9,900 cubic metres and legally it's not fracking. The lawyer will stand up with a straight face saying, no, the regulations say this is not fracking because it's below the 10,000 10, cubic metre threshold. So this is the kind of what I think is a dirty trick by um, the British government, the current legislators, to try and help as far as they can the oil industry. Now let's finish off by looking at what has happened in the US. No one's actually tried to put these figures together before, which is surprising. I've only done it for gas because it's simpler than doing it for oil, because there are areas like the Permian Basin where there's a mixture of conventional and unconventional going on at the same time in the same place be very hard to separate the two. But for the gas wells, it's very simple. And you can get the daily price of the gas and the volume produced, all from government figures. And you multiply these together. I've only taken the monthly averages, just to make the spreadsheet a bit smaller. But the income over the period of the main activity, 2007 to 2016, the income has been 324 billion US, which sounds very impressive, until you look at the drilling costs, which are already bigger than that figure, excluding other costs, which I've conservatively estimated at 20%, 74 billion. And the big thing is what these companies live off, it's the sale of debt, as they call it. They issue junk bonds or high yield bonds, but they're junk bonds, you know, classified by Standard and Poor or by Moody's. They have zero value, they're very high risk. But people are mug enough to buy these bonds. So you want to buy a bond, I say, yeah, give me $100 and I'll give it back to you in six years' time 
and I'm going to pay you 6% a year interest. But after the five or six years are up, you've got $36 back in your annual dividend, and then they say, sorry, we've no money left, we're going bust, so you've lost your capital. Or what some of them are doing, they're restructuring at the end of this shale bubble, they're restructuring their debt, which means, well, we can't give you your $100 back, but here's some shares for free, which are, of course, essentially worthless because they're penny shares. So it's a sort of take it or leave it thing. It's all been a gigantic Ponzi scheme funded by the sale of debt. Now, you might argue that the infrastructure for all these drilling all these horizontal wells has been put in place, and only six or ten years later, you know, there's still a load of oil or gas to come out of it. I'm talking gas in this case. But that's not true because the so-called decline curve for all these gas well areas, this is for the Marcellus shale area of Pennsylvania, most of the production happens in the first 18 months or two years. And basically after five or eight years, all these gas wells are dead. The, you know, the gas is reduced to a trickle and you know, you're not going to get any more income out of it. So this unsustainable Ponzi scheme has burst after only about less than 10 years. And this has been measured by one of the various criteria you can use to measure it is a service company called Baker Hughes, which is a bit like Halliburton. They issue weekly figures of the rig count in North America, which means how many rigs are active. And you can see from that, here was this uh, feeding frenzy of drilling activity, which lasted roughly from 2004. Uh, the graph goes from 2004 to 2018. There's the shale bubble with all this peak of drilling activity which has completely died off. There is a bit of a recovery going on in certain areas, like the Permian Basin of Texas, and drilling has gone back up again. And now these companies that have survived the bubble period and have restructured, they're now offering new bonds and they're offering 15% to suck in the investors. So that's how this industry works. It's unsustainable in the US never mind all the environmental problems that should be left behind for future generations. Um, and given that drilling in the much more heavily populated and less experienced UK, we're not Texas or Oklahoma, the basic drilling costs and production costs are, will be in round terms, even the industry admits it, about double those of the US. So if it's financially unsuccessful in the, UK, uh, in the US, it will never ever work in the UK. So, to finish off, um, the people now operating in the UK, unlike the big sensible companies of 35 years ago like Conical, BP, Shell, they are now the penny share cowboy companies uh, trying to make a fast buck in the wield. Uh, the UK government is trying to aid them by all sorts of Orwellian legal definitions. Their regulation is fragmented and poor in my opinion, it's divided between various agencies, and things like the geology tend to fall through the cracks. And last of all, maybe the most important thing of all, it's not commercially viable. It'll never work, even commercially, never mind the environmental problems. So I think this year will be the crux year, where the whole thing may suddenly start to collapse. So I admire the um, protectors at camps up and down the country. I think some of you are here tonight. You're doing a great job in just delaying them by all means possible. Because in the long run, we're doing the mug investors a favour. The whole, the whole industry will collapse eventually, just on financial grounds, if nothing else, mm -hmm. despite the efforts by the current government to help them. So I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.